Which is about 12, give or take, and suppers, 30, give or take. They're giving us uh, reruns, two nights in a row. And if I only had pork chops, I'd really be going. He had these little rituals that he would do with his food. He would get himself almost like he was sitting in a barca lounger at home with a big TV tray, and he'd store up his food from all day long and sit there and just eat it happily in front of the TV screen. This is how I sit all the time when I'm watching TV. In the old days, I had pork chops. I'd really put on this shit. I'd have nine, ten pork chops, chips, old beans laid out, six-pack soda. Guys, he a pest when he go on it. But if we initially saw Pasco as a foodie behind bars, the footage he recorded on the camera we gave him revealed the troubled past. I'm in prison for 60 year bid for murder. I killed my nephew's ex-wife. I was drunk, high on uh, marijuana at the time. I'm not the boy that I was. 20 years later, I'm a man. I live my life as a man. And here I am, a convict. By Sifa saying he was a convict, he was basically saying his crimes were not against a child or of a sexual nature against a woman, and he lives by the convict code, which in prison is a big deal. The laws of the convict is you don't disrespect others, you don't steal, you pay your debts, you never become a punk or a bitch. I've done that. My reputation is clean. But Pasco's status as a convict was threatened by another distinction in prison's complicated social structure. Those animals out. We were interviewing Cephas at his cell, and he was anxiously awaiting the bell for chow hall. And he came out, and he was walking down. We were following him. I heard some inmates scream out something. I wasn't actually sure what they had said. But his reaction was so severe, I assumed it had to have been a major insult. Be a gentleman now. What? Call me that. You talking chow hall? Chomo is prison slang for child molester, but it can also be used to define anyone who has a sexual offense. We caught up with Pasco later that day. He was at the cell block microwave preparing his evening meal. You call that spaghetti? I call that just wet noodles. At first, Pasco was reluctant to talk about the earlier confrontation in the hallway. Let's talk out there later. Oh, I'm talking now. I've been down 20 years. I'm a murderer. I'm a convict. Nobody disrespects me like that. I got some little punk coming in. He's been in for a little time and run his little mouth. Fine. That gets you killed in here. I'm murdered. I'm a straight up convict. The more Cephas tried to convince us he was a convict, the more I wondered if there was something else going on. A few days later, Pasco told us what did go on the night he committed murder. I was at a bar drinking one night, had nine shots of whiskey and several beers, and gave a ride to my sister-in-law, I think it is, or something like that, nephew's ex-wife. Uh, we, she lured me on to the dog town, which is the river camps, and we started to have sex, and she backed out of it and got into an argument, and uh, she started smacking me around, and I had a hair trigger temper back then, so I just snapped on her and went off. I stabbed her, I broke her neck, and smashed her skull in. Pasco claims his rage erupted because his victim rejected him and that they never did have sex. But some of the evidence indicated otherwise. Well, they turned it into a rape trial. 
They did their test, and there was a presence of spermatozoa. And she was partially new. Suddenly, I heard an inmate off camera yell something. And Cephas's whole persona changed. What are you looking at? Cephas. I'm marking someone. Why? Because he just said child molester. Break his neck. That's total disrespect for anyone in a prison, especially for some uh, convict like me that's been down for so many years and I got some kid talking trash. I know who he is and I'll, and I'll find him. I'm going to have a little discussion with him. Today? No, I'll find him. I'll wait till y'all leave. When I find a guy, I'm gonna put him in a hospital. I don't kill no more, but I'm damn sure gonna maim him. That's all it is to it. Later that night, Pasco again recorded himself on the camera we left him. He indicated that he had exacted revenge. At one point, I was uh, doing an interview and a bunch of wannabe inmates started yelling chomo these idiots had to be taught a lesson they were properly disciplined in the, the ways of prison etiquette we checked with the authorities to see if anybody had been injured that night and there were no reports that indicated that but later Pasco shifted his thoughts from his tormentors to his victim. Many guys ask me why I'm doing this tape. The reason why is I want to leave something for my family, as well as for the Rosie's family, the victim. She was a good woman, a good person. Snuff out that light. Uh, um, this is Seamus Pascal signing off from ISP prison, Indiana State. Good luck to us all. Tell me not. If you cross me, I'm going to give it to you, you know what I mean? Because I'm a good mother. One of the Maricopa County Jail's most notorious inmates solidifies her reputation by entering into a forbidden relationship. Yeah, they wrote me up for um, being with an officer. At every prison or jail we visit for lockup, the safe management of the inmate population is the staff's number one priority. Violent inmates are usually confined to their cells at least 23 hours a day. When movement throughout the facility is necessary, it's usually under close supervision and with the inmate shackled at both the wrists and ankles. But at the Maricopa County Jail in Phoenix, Arizona, we discovered that for some inmates, even these precautions weren't sufficient. Here, a pod that would normally hold 32 inmates had been cleared in order to manage just four female inmates with violent reputations. It just limits their ability to threaten other staff, to go after the officers. It's just a very, very controlled setting. When I first went in there, I was surprised to see that there were only four inmates that were actually housed in that area. But once I met them all individually, my impression kind of quickly changed and I realized that there's a reason why these four women are kept away from the rest of the population. The four inhabitants of this pod were all well known throughout Maricopa, but none had a more notorious in-house reputation than Rosalva Rosie Trevino. If you cross me, oh, I'm going to give it to you, you know what I mean? Because I'm a good mother and, you know, I'll respect you and give you your loyalty, your understanding, your respect. I'll give you everything in one package if you up little by little, then disrespect me, then I'm gonna beat your ass. You know what I mean? That's where I'm gonna come full force your way. 
Trevino had spent the last six years inside Maricopa fighting a murder charge that could have earned her the death penalty. During that time, she was involved in numerous assaults on staff. A rude dude with the attitude. That's what they call me, the officers. In fact, Trevino told us she couldn't even remember how many times she had been tased. My whole back, I have like scars. This is a big one. This one's where I could put my finger in. You see how big it is? I just didn't care. I was in there for the death penalty case. I didn't have nothing to lose. I mean, I have my family, don't get me wrong, and my son and everything like that. But I just had that mentality. So I was like, that. I'm going to give him hell. Sometimes you get the nice, sweet Rosie if she wants to be nice and sweet. And sometimes you get the crazy, I'm going to kill you, Rosie. But Trevino proved that both Rosies could be equally dangerous. I want to touch it. And the staff warned me about this. She can actually draw people in, which she did on many occasions. And one of the stories that's very well known about Rosie among the detention officers is that she actually developed a personal relationship with one of the t detention officers. She just we started flirting around and I don't know, one thing led to another. I really thought she was going to set me up. I really thought she was working for the prosecutor. When Trevino entered into a relationship with one of the jail's female detention officers, it was considered a serious breach of security. Yeah, they wrote me up for uh, being with an officer and that I was a danger to this facility because of her, because she knew the blueprints or whatever, you know. An officer and an inmate having a relationship is a tremendous issue from a security perspective. The concern is that the officer can do favors or can even potentially smuggle things in to inmates, whether that be a weapon or whether that be drugs. They think that I manipulated her. Like, she never brought me no drugs or nothing like that. It's like food, I, you, know, you know, things. The inmates call that hooking an officer, and that's a game for them. And in the past, there has been contests between Trevino and other inmates to see how many or if they can hook an officer. She does have um, a reputation for actually, um, you could say, sucking the officers in, getting them to play her game. I mean, it's an easy enough thing to avoid. But some people just are weaker than others, I'm assuming. When the relationship was discovered, the officer chose to relinquish her badge rather than turn her back on Trevino. She moved in with my mom, and she's like, she raised my son. I mean, I cared about her, but I wasn't like, I didn't know how serious it was until after I had her in my house with my mom, and it was like, she helped my mom, my dad out a lot, and my son loves her. If an inmate wants to be your friend, that's your first warning sign right there. The officer in question, she listened and believed exactly what Trevino told her. You know, she said, yeah, great, wow, I'm interested in you, gets fired, comes back to be, you know, I guess in love with this young lady, and now Trevino's done because she no longer can be a help to her. She's no longer an officer. It's crazy, huh? What love does. <laughs> Trevino says that although the former officer is still close to her family, the two of them have cooled their relationship. No, I wouldn't say we're dating no more. I mean, she went her way, I'm my way. I mean, I'm looking at death penalty, you know what I mean? I'm, but um, I have good memories with her. <laughs> During our final days of shooting at Maricopa, Rosie Trevino continued to prove unpredictable. After a difficult court hearing concerning her murder case, she attempted suicide though it was quickly thwarted by jail staff. I was kind of shocked because she was actually a pretty happy person. She seemed really comfortable in her environment. She seemed to have built a really strong relationship with the three other females in her pod. Then just days later, Trevino and her lawyer reached a plea bargain, which spared her the death penalty. She was sentenced to 18 years in the Arizona state prison system. Coming up. I stabbed him in his lungs and his kidneys, and he basically drowned in his own blood. In prison for manslaughter, one inmate's past can come back to haunt him. Before I was a inmate, you know, I was a correctional officer here at this facility.
In prison, we often find unusual stories can be found in the most mundane settings. That happened at the penitentiary of New Mexico when we met inmate Daniel Rapatz during his shift in the prison laundry. We do the facility laundry here on a daily basis. One day we'll do yellows, one day we'll do whites, one day we'll do blankets. The leg irons are for security reasons. That way we can't run. There's really nowhere we could go anyway. Rapatz was serving time for manslaughter. But we discovered a different story in his past, one that threatened his reputation among staff and inmates alike. Before I was an inmate, you know, I was a correctional officer here at this facility, at, well, the penitentiary of New Mexico, you know, about 13 years ago. An inmate who was former law enforcement is going to always be perceived as the enemy as far as the other inmates go. So it's usually a precarious situation. Given his circumstances, I thought Daniel was pretty secure. Going from being a former CO to an inmate in the same prison where he once worked, I would have expected him to be a little more nervous, uptight, what have you, but he acclimated quite well. The officers, some of them treated me the same, some of them treated me different. For the most part, though, um, I've always gone along with people. I came into prison and I ain't here to prove a point. I'm just here to do my time. Is it weird? Was it weird at first dealing with officers? Did you run into people you knew from? Yeah, I mean, I ran into a few people and that, and they just, hey, real pats, because that's what everyone calls me by my last name. What, que paso? What happened? You know, how did you end up here in the joint? You know, what happened? And I tell them, you know, I ended up wrong place, wrong time, and out drinking and using drugs and alcohol, and I messed up my life. As we continue to interview Rapatz, we learned that although this was his first conviction as an adult, it was hardly his first brush with the law. I just started stealing cars at a young age and breaking into schools. I broke into my junior high and my high school. At 11 years old, I was living like I was 21. Between the ages of 13 and 18, Rapatz did time in juvenile detention centers in several states. But then once I turned 18, I got my files sealed, and I actually got my life together until I was about 24. I did do good, and I was trying to change my life around. With his juvenile files sealed, Rapatz had a fresh start at life. At age 19, he was hired as a correctional officer at the penitentiary of New Mexico. But for him, it wasn't a career. It was a stepping stone to the job he really wanted. Basically, the reason I was a CEO was so I could get the training I needed so I could work security at the casino, which is where I'm from, up in northern New Mexico. I knew if I came and did the academy class here and got all that training, that I would have no problem getting where I wanted to go work. Rapatz eventually landed the casino job. But he also began using drugs again. Rapat says he was drunk and high when he got into an argument that ended with him taking a life. I stabbed him in his lungs and his kidneys, and he basically drowned in his own blood. Rapatz was convicted of manslaughter, along with several other charges, including resisting arrest and battery of a police officer. He soon returned to the penitentiary of New Mexico, this time in a yellow inmate jumpsuit. People say you don't live with regrets, but anyone who says that's a liar because you do live with regrets. Because I do regret, I didn't even hardly know the guy, and I killed him. I took a guy's life that I didn't even hardly know. Rapatz's last day as a correctional officer was about five years before his first day as an inmate. He was hoping to stay under the radar. But he couldn't. The prison obviously had to put Daniel into protective custody because he was a former CO. And Daniel abhorred this because you're perceived in a very negative light by the other inmates if you actually have to live in protective custody. I don't like being in PC. I hate it. It sucks because I'm around a lot of people that are shady. You know, I'm not in prison because of messed up charges like rape or child molesting. I've never ever ratted or snitched on no one in my life. And he wanted to make it clear to everyone that he was being forced into protective custody by the prison administration, but that was not his choice. He chose to align himself with the inmates. 
he completely identified as an inmate. But Rapatz recognized that his past would always make his safety in prison a gamble. All it takes is one inmate trying to get his, his bones, what we call stripes. He might come try and hit me on the line somewhere. So but that's a chance I was willing to take. You know, I wanted to do a waiver. I wanted to be on the line. And you know, whatever happened, happened, you know. Um, to me, it sucks. I'm not gonna lie, it sucks. It ain't no good. There's the paperwork. I think back and say, you know, what did I do? You know, I messed up my life big time. And look at me now. Coming up. Cause the night center comes out blasting. Yeah, I'm about as hungry as a Taliban fasting. So Rap like unites two gangsters. But age has them on two very different paths. Everybody's like that. When they're young, they don't see the big picture. They can't see it yet. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just whatever happens, happens. Due to mature subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. During our time at any prison, we meet inmates who want to share their talents with us. More often than not, rap is the artistic expression of choice. I ain't already done to me. Hell, my own gun to me. Pull the trigger suddenly. Locked up, locked up. Ha! Thinking about some things. Huh. Thinking about some things that never change in the game. I always have given me nothing but penitentiary as my meat knows to root fist spits right. My game takes flight. Love is just a feeling, but pain is life. And all the bad I've seen, I'm trying to make it right. There's so many rappers to choose from. It's difficult to decide who makes the cut. I used to walk around with a chip on my shoulder, but now the that went from a chip to a boulder. I get solicited a lot by the inmates to hear their raps that they've been working on while they're incarcerated. In fact, it happens so much that I have developed a system for it, which is I use the associate producer, Jake, to audition them before hearing their raps. And if Jake gives them the thumbs up, then I'll, then I'll take a lesson. The plan first went into effect at the Maricopa County Jail in Phoenix, Arizona. He kind of used me for the litmus test, so to speak, on if they were good or not. So at one point I was told, hey, come on up here. And I went up and there they were. Cousin Ice and Duke are low, were two of the most interesting inmates that I've ever met working on lockup. Yeah, yeah, cause the night center comes out blasting, yeah, I'm about as hungry as a Taliban fasting, so just like the clumps, I'ma feel my plate, ghetto grinding all day, it's a crime buffet. I was actually blown away for being two different artists from two different locations. They actually worked well together. So just remember if you like it or not, if you floss what you got me in my bus shot, bus shot, bus shot. Cousin Ice is really 45-year-old Titus Fisher. He was at Maricopa, awaiting trial on a charge of firearm possession by an ex-felon. Then we make toilet music. You heard it up there, the, right on the toilet and the desk. You got to make your own beats, you know what I mean? Fisher's cellmate is 20-year-old Danell Thompson. Better known here as Duker Loke. I got a name. You got a name? Duker Loke is the South Soccer. Thompson was at Maricopa appealing two murder convictions that could land him in prison for at least 32 years. Keep the noise down over there. Rap has helped the two men bridge their generation gap. He's trying to film. The Sellies share one other thing in common. They're both members of the Crips Street Gang. But they were at very different stages in their life. Cousin Ice was no longer in love with the lifestyle. I haven't actually went out gangbanging, shooting at people just because they're from across town and all that. I haven't done that in years, but I still hang with my homeboys and, and you know I mean if something happened to one of my close close ones I'm gonna have to help retaliate you know what I mean Duker Loke on the other hand was still caught up in the game 
he was still infatuated with this romantic notion of being a gangster. What do you want for your future? Money, power, respect. <laughs> Top of the food chain. I think everybody's like that when they're young. They don't see the big picture. They can't see it yet. You know what I mean? They just, it's just whatever happens, happens. Having been in and out of state prisons in California, Fisher sought to share his wisdom with the younger Thompson. I got him out of situations and hear that he was finna just react to some and, and I'm telling you, you can't always just react. You know what I mean? You gotta slow down and think about something real quick. And then he thanks me later on, like, yeah, man, you're right. I'm glad I didn't just do that. Yeah, he can keep me cool, because I'm real hot-headed, you know what I mean? Quick to snap him somebody real quick. No problem, no, no worry about nothing, but, but he keep me out of it cool. Despite the fact that there was a sort of mentor relationship, you could see that Cousin Ice couldn't totally impart all that he had learned in his years onto Duker. This is a new generation. Gotta take all y'all old folks out. <laughs> 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 What's going Fisher told us the gang banging has changed since he was Thompson's age. We just wanted to protect our side of town, you know what I mean? Which, I mean, none of us own nothing over there, but we call it our side of town. When I was 18, it wasn't. You, you heard about somebody getting shot maybe once every three months. Now it's every day somebody's getting shot. Donnell Thompson can attest to that. He's been shot eight times. I ain't scared of death, though. They're scared of me. Prosecutors allege that Thompson has been on the other side of the gun plenty of times. Besides the murder convictions he's currently appealing, Thompson was charged with three additional drive-by murders while we were at Maricopa. He has pled not guilty to the new charges. Cousin Ice, cousin. Nice, cousin. Yeah, you know what I mean? Just because I'm Duker Love. Every time somebody body comes messing up, you know what I mean? They say I did it. But Donnell Thompson had other choices in life before he took on the persona of Duker Loke. He would have been a star football player. Duker had scholarships to, to colleges, running back. He chose to do the other, you know what I mean? So. That's, that's mentality. Yeah, I was ranked. I wasn't ranked in the nation and state, but I told the streets over that. Why? The streets attracted me more. Well, I love the streets. The streets are my bitch. <laughs> what excites you about? Just the banging, the guns, the money, the killing, all of it. <laughs> but to Thompson's cellmate and sometime mentor, Wasting such potential is the real crime. And that's something that Titus Fisher was determined to see not happen to his own children. He moved his family from California to Arizona to help them avoid a future of gangbanging. I seen my son getting ready to start when he was only 14, so I hurry up and got him out here. That's another reason I moved out here, you know what I mean? When we moved out here, I said, now you can, you can be whatever you want to be, you know what I mean? And right now he's straight A's. He hasn't got a B in like three years. He's straight A's. He's on the football team, he's a star football player. So he's he's on his way to do something. You know what I mean? Thompson also has three children, but their future seems less certain. Yeah, I had a son. He go bang with daddy bang. <laughs> really, is that what you want for him? Yeah, he do. He gonna live the same life. But if he chooses other way, then hey, go ahead. So for you, it's not a negative for him to spend a lot of time in prison, for your son. And it's not a negative for you. Nah. In another context, in another environment, it might be a parent saying to their child, if you don't end up being a doctor, I'll still love you. With Duker, it was like, if his son didn't end up being a crip, he would still love him. I love the life I choose. I love I was born into it, you know what I mean? And you go end up in prison or in that casket, you know what I mean? Kill us season. And damn show sure I'ma get away control of all the ever deeds. Kill us season. Coming up. I'm part of a pretty intimidating group, like when we're on the yard, we're 20, 30 deep, uh, pretty big white boys. Nobody really challenges that. A gang leader with a twist. I was expecting this mean, tough, hardcore guy, and instead, 
It was this Tommy that we came to know. It's been said that inmates in maximum security prisons live their lives based on the three R's. Respect, reputation, and revenge. The same could be said of prison gangs. No matter where we're filming, whether it's the United States or around the world, gangs are a big problem for prisons. It's a secret society with a code of silence. But when we went to a prison in Colorado, at Lyman Correctional Facility, we met a gang leader there that seemed to be a bit different. It might have had something to do with the two officers we met there. Those two officers are Lieutenants Jim Fox and Andy Piper. We're not going to quit coming in here and shaking you down, so you better quit. Don't look for sympathy. I'm not. Square yourself away. Check yourself. Knock this off. Then maybe you can get into a program. They were completely in sync with each other when they, when they were doing their work. They were obviously very good friends as well, but they were complete opposites in terms of how they looked, how they acted, their whole personas, but they were extremely effective at what they did. What did you do before corrections? Worked on a ranch mostly. This was quite a culture shock to me. And they drug me off the horse and put me in here, and I'd never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> Working on a ranch, what did you do? Roped, doctored. You're a cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> You're a cowboy. Basically. And Lieutenant Fox had that cowboy persona on the job. He always told it like it was. You're not going to manipulate the system here at Lyman. You're going to go through the process just like every other inmate that comes in here does. And if that means that you go out in population, that's where you're going to go. Lieutenant Fox was the more gregarious of the two, while Lieutenant Piper was pretty quiet. But when he did speak, he was very direct. You know, that's never correct. He could be tough. Are you speaking? Are you speaking? You're saying something. Don't. And sometimes he had a very dry sense of humor. You stay away from the ice cream. <laughs> One of the men's specific duties was to gather intelligence okay. on the prison's various gangs. We're probably unique in how we deal with the gangs out here. We've accepted the fact that there are going to be gangs, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we try to control you know, what they do, and we use the leaders a lot to control that. And they know that uh, if there's problems out here, they can come to us and not be a snitch. Oh, no. um, part is the clout that they carry. Out on the yard, there's not hardly anybody out there that's going to walk up to a leader and call him a snitch. That's part of it, and part of it is uh, the rapport that we build over the years with them. Um, they trust us, and, 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 and in turn, we, we trust them somewhat. One of the gang leaders the officers cultivated a relationship with was Tommy Holloman. These guys, they know everything. There's a lot of rats at this place, so these cops, they know everything that goes on, pretty much. We had been hearing about Tommy Holloman for a while while we were at Lyman as the shot caller of this white supremacist gang. So when we first encountered him, I was a little taken aback. I was expecting this mean, tough, hardcore guy, and instead, it was this Tommy that we came to know who seemed shy, a little timid, a little withdrawn. I have a pretty good heart. My mom, she's uh, you know, she's always had foster kids, and she's worked in a group home. So I mean, I've always wanted to do what she did. I've always wanted to have been able to help somebody, and I really think I can. During our shoot at Lyman, Holloman was brought in for questioning when another inmate had accused him of extortion. Hey, <laughs> Watching Lieutenant Fox deal with Tommy was very interesting. They had a certain rapport. I would almost call it a professional rapport. Go on in and have a seat. So you want to give me your story? Well, I mean, to be honest, I don't really have one. I mean, I feel like this dude is just trying to get out of trouble. He knows who I am, and I go under the bus every time. They each seemed to know what the other's okay. boundaries were. They talked in a very amicable way. And Fox was giving Tommy advice on how to stay out of trouble. If you're doing anything, quit. Why not? Go over there and lay low. You know they got a target on you. Yeah. Well, the good thing about Fox and Piper is they don't ask questions that they know that they shouldn't. They're not going to ask me straight out what happened and why. They're going to ask if I know anything about it. They don't push me if I say no. 
Alright, for sure. The extortion investigation eventually led Fox and Piper to conclude that the inmate who had made the accusation was actually angling for a transfer to another prison. And Holloman was cleared. But Holloman has had his share of trouble. He was originally sentenced to 30 years for assault and attempted robbery after he stabbed a man during a street fight. I was charged with first degree assault, which I thought really wasn't that serious. I thought, well, if it's not murder, then maybe he wasn't too bad. And it turns out that uh, I stabbed him in his lung and he bled out like twice. I had to go through a couple surgeries and uh, I got the uh, attempted robbery because um, I was going through his pockets. That's, that's where I found the knife. It was his knife and uh, took off and that was it, really. During his early years at Lyman, Holloman gained a reputation for violence as well. When you have a 30-year sentence, you have to go in with a mindset that you're probably never going to get out. Or if you do, you're going to be an old man. So you don't really care about anything. That's what you're supposed to do in prison. You're supposed to do heroin and fight and, you know what I mean, who gives a crap? So I did a lot of that. He was kind of like a Tony Soprano of sorts. And just like Tony Soprano, he was a very personable and likable guy. I mean, you know, kind of a mama's boy. And on the other hand, I probably wouldn't want to cross him. I'm a pretty big guy. Nobody's going to call me out. I'm part of a pretty intimidating group. Like when we're on the yard, we're, you know, 20, 30 deep, uh, pretty big white boys. Nobody really challenges that. So it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Holloman made it to the top of his prison gang. But then the unexpected happened. He caught a break in his case. A reclassification hearing on his 30-year sentence was influenced by an unlikely source. So the day before my hearing, uh, this guy that I, that I stabbed wrote a letter to the judge uh, saying that I deserved a second chance and that uh, I was given a long time and it's not fair because of my mistake that my family had to suffer and lose a son, you know, and, uh, you know, it was pretty amazing. And I mean, I had a lot of people, you know, they, they spoke at the hearing. The judge cut Holloman's sentence in half to 15 years with the understanding that any violent acts in prison would restore the original 30-year sentence. You get this whole new perspective. You get this chance at some kind of life outside of prison. But for Holloman, nothing seems certain. I get my sentence cut in half when I don't deserve it. I wasn't doing anything to better myself in prison. Just because I gave back all that time, you know, I'm still a convict now. You know, this is still my world until I get out. So, I mean, it was tough to balance that, to, you know, try to do good and better myself and, you know, hope for parole or something. But at the same time, you know, stay true to how I was schooled in prison and, you know, not kind of showing weakness and, you know, things like that. Here's why you're a conundrum. You, you certainly seem to be one of these people who has a lot of potential. Yeah. Certainly a leader. Mm -hmm. We've all established that. Um, you're smart. But you don't seem to want to give up a criminal lifestyle. So that's why I'm curious as to what you really think is going to happen in five years when you get out of here. Well, uh, uh, I'll say this. I, uh, I'm not going to let the hope or chance of getting out soon change how I'm going to do my time now. Because my reality today is this is where I'm at. When I get out, this is, that's a different world. It'll be a different life. I'll be able to do different things, learn new things, you know what I mean? But my reality is this place. So why would I change that? You know what I mean? I can't because the minute I do, you know, I lose my identity. I was hoping for his sake that he makes the right choice because he has all the things where he could succeed on the outside. He has family support. He's a smart guy. He has a desire to change. So we all left hoping that he was going to do the right thing. I can't think of tomorrow because tomorrow isn't here. I have to do things this way because, uh, you know, this is where I'm at. Coming up. All you could hear were the sound of birds, 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 birds. One of the most unusual prisons we've ever seen. While the pursuit of the three R's of prison, respect, reputation, and revenge, seem to permeate the lives of most inmates, 
Our trip to a Serbian prison from Lock Up World Tour revealed a potential fourth R, roosters. We had been told that this is the prison that houses the most notorious criminals of Serbia. But you would never know that by touring the grounds of Zabala, a maximum security prison located in the Serbian countryside outside Belgrade. They had done the grounds up beautifully, and you heard birds everywhere. All you could hear were the sound of birds, 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 birds. That was very surprising to me. We couldn't escape it. The prison's garden-like grounds and collection of birds, including peacocks, were part of a renovation project. Prison officials felt that a relaxing natural environment could help their rehabilitation efforts. It did have, actually, a much calmer feel to it than I expected. You know, the, the build-up was pretty big. Serbia's biggest, most notorious prison, and then here I am with peacocks and birds and cats wandering around. In fact, when we wandered into the prison shoe factory where inmate workers make dozens of shoes per day, the scene was more reminiscent of a Disney film than a prison. This is our pet, Kitcha, called Kitcha, yes. <laughs> this shoe shop was, was a pretty unique area that we uh, got to film in. And the, just the fact that all the shoes were being made by hand. And then we're in the middle of uh, a conversation with a guy and a, a parakeet comes and lands on the guy's shoulder. It just everything combined, it was just really, uh, really unique. And as a cameraman,